Welcome to everybody. It's lovely to have you with us. And I really uh, want to uh, thank you for joining us this evening. I really hope you enjoy it. So you should be able to see my screen. I'm going to be looking over here, which is where my, my talk is. And uh, the title is, Are the World's Existence About to Collapse? And that's the title I chose because some people really think they are. But we'll come to the answer at the end. Um, but this is my favorite uh, photograph. It looks like it's been photoshopped, but it hasn't. I wanted to use this for my uh, book cover. But what it is is people uh, playing golf right in front of a forest fire. That's actually happening right there. So uh, perhaps a useful little metaphor for where we are right now, maybe. There's a point for discussion right there. We can talk about golf. So this evening uh, is now the time for a blatant plug uh, for the book that I've just had published. This is called Ecosystem Collapse and Recovery. And this event is a sort of launch event uh, for the book. It's the first ever scientific monograph about ecosystem collapse. And I wanted to call it just that, but um, my book uh, publishers, Cambridge University Press said, no, no, you can't do that. That's far too negative and bleak. So it's got to be about something positive as well, which is why it's got recovery in the title. And actually, I'm really glad they suggested that because the two things are connected, as we might uh, find out later. But you can all buy yourself a copy of this and give one. I know some of you already have, so thank you very much. I hope you enjoy it. OK, so when I was starting to develop ideas for this book, something really terrible uh, was going on. This is back in uh, 2016, 2017, when this is a, uh, an article that appeared in The Guardian newspaper, which used the words ecosystem collapse in relation to what was happening to the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, complete ecosystem collapse was how it was described. Now, this is clearly a really terrible event that we'll say a little bit more about in a minute. But what struck me was, here's a phrase, ecosystem collapse, that as scientists, we haven't really used much. It was quite a new term, but the media grabbed hold of it and started to use it a lot. So that really made me think, well, really, we need to uh, put our thinking caps on as scientists and say something about this. So that's why I wrote the book. And I had a whole load of questions around, well, why did this happen? What's going on? And what might the consequences be? And uh, could it happen to other ecosystems as well as uh, the Great Barrier Reef? So I didn't know the answer to these questions. So the point of writing the book for me was to find out the answers. Well, interestingly, as, uh, as the time went by, uh, by the while I was busy writing it, uh, Greta Thunberg here, she did a great job of popularizing big system collapses of things. She kept saying, our ecosystems are collapsing. Great for you, Greta. She obviously can see she's, she's not very happy about it. And uh, quite rightly, she's very angry and uh, very emotional about it, actually. But it helped put the concept on the map. And even David Atom, much more sage commentators, it's been around many, many years now, has started to use the phrase himself. So it's really caught on. But in terms of scientific circles, there's actually very little been written about it until the last few years. So the only formal definition of what uh, collapses is provided by this thing. It's called the IUCN Red List of Ecosystems. And this is an assessment project to try and assess the state or condition of the world's ecosystems. And when this came out, I got very interested because at the top of the uh, diagram here, you can see they say collapsed. It's like the end point of a process of degradation of an ecosystem. And that's the first time that had really been formalized in this way. You may have heard of the uh, IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. They provide assessments every couple of years around which species are at risk of extinction. But this is a new initiative that's following a similar kind of approach, but for ecosystems and instead of species. Uh, but they're doing it in a very similar way with these different categories of collapse risk. And uh, they define it for us. So here's a useful definition, a transformation of identity, a loss of defining features, and a replacement by a different ecosystem type. Now that's really interesting uh, because for the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, of course they're concerned about extinction of a species and extinction is always forever. But this isn't quite the same. Uh, ecosystems don't go extinct. Instead, 
they're replaced by another type of ecosystem. So it's a process of transformation. So that's quite different, and we'll we'll come to that later. Okay, so the uh, the Red List of Ecosystems Initiative has so far assessed about 60 ecosystems worldwide. It's a slow, ongoing process. The only one they found that's completely collapsed is this one. It's the Aral Sea, which is a an inland sea in Central Asia. And you can see in 1989, it's quite an extensive uh, large water body. And now most of it's gone. And this is really... Uh, really sad for the people who live there because there's a big community or, or there was a big community of fishermen and uh, you know big local uh, industry around the products harvested from this lake but that's all gone now and what's amazing is on the map if you go to the map of this part of the world it's no longer called a sea it's called a desert so that shows us that ecosystems can actually disappear completely or they can collapse Maybe it's been transformed here from an inland sea into a desert. So a different sort of ecosystem has replaced it. And that's all happened within the last sort of 30 years or so. So that sort of set, sets alarm bells ringing. And if we go back to the case of the Barrier Reef, they start ringing even more. Because um, what happened to the Barrier Reef is a process of coral bleaching. Now, you may have heard of this. What this is to do with is, that the corals, which you can see here on the left, they're actually symbiotic organisms that live in association with, a, with an alga. And this alga is actually emitted. It leaves the coral when the temperatures of the water get too high. So the water temperature can get over a threshold. Suddenly the corals no longer have their algal partners. They float off into the sea. And the corals left alone, it's no longer able to access photosynthesis products from the alga. And they usually, they bleach, they go white and very skeletal, and uh, they, they usually die. So there's a lot of concern then about the impact of global warming, and particularly on the oceans, and what that will do uh, to coral reefs. Now, the Great Barrier Reef, we need to remind ourselves just how special it is. Uh, it's the world's largest collection of reefs with a boggling 400 species of coral and even more mind-blowing, 1,500 species of fish. And for those of you who love snails and clams, things like that, and even more mind-bending, 4,000 species of mollusk, which is truly exceptional diversity. But on top of that, of course, they're beautiful, wonderful, colorful, dynamic places full of movement and uh, very, very special. So it's been really tragic to see what's happened to the Great Barrier Reef. So this recent bleaching event has killed about a third of the coral in the central and northern parts of the reef, and more than 90% of the whole reef, remember this is the biggest one on the planet, has been bleached to some extent, and more than half of the fish have gone. So this was happening as I was starting to write this book, and I thought, this is a terrible event. I know researchers who worked there, they were just reduced to tears by this, quite understandably, it's places that they've worked on and loved destroyed within just a few months. And that's the concerning thing here, that it's telling us that ecosystems can change radically in a very short period of time. So it's this abrupt change, I think, uh, that we could refer to as collapse. Now, this is a cafe scientifique, so you need to have some science, but don't panic. It's gonna be over very quickly in the, uh, in the book that I wrote, I had a whole chapter about theory. And to be good science, I think there should be a bit of theory in that. And so I'm going to give you a bit, but there's no equations and no math, so don't panic. Um, but most of the theory in this topic is communicated in diagrams like this. So they're usually little balls rolling around a sort of bumpy landscape, a bit like an egg, egg box. So what does this mean? Well, the ball represents the state of the ecosystem. And that can change over time. So we now know that all ecosystems can actually move between different states. And that's what these little dimples are on, the, uh, uh, on this diagram here. They're places where the ball might come to rest as it moves around. So they're relatively stable states. And what this shows is that an ecosystem will vary over time, moving between these states, maybe grassland to forest to shrubland and back again. 
uh, that can happen as part of the natural variation of the ecosystem. But also something else can happen. This arrow here shows the ball moving into a new space. Now it's transforming into something else. And that's what we might call collapse. And this is another diagram that shows the same thing. And if you like, you can imagine a little ball rolling around here to uh, compare it with that previous diagram. It's basically the same. But the question is, what, why is the ball moving at all? And the answer is this arrow here. I'm sorry about this. My designer used rather fluorescent colors here, so I do apologize for that. Uh, it'll keep you awake, though. So the pressures are the key thing. So these are human things, human activities, things like nitrogen pollution, harvesting species, maybe climate change as well. They're pressures that can push the ball. But let's see what happens. It may be being pushed down this slope. So the ecosystem is changing, but then suddenly it changes much more rapidly. And that's what we call uh, an ecological threshold or a tipping point. You may have heard of that phrase. And this is what they mean by a tipping point. It's a, a crucial threshold above which suddenly things change a lot more quickly just like we saw in the Great Barrier Reef. So that's why people are concerned about collapse. It's that you can have a very small change in the pressures and, and things may change very gradually, but then suddenly there's this capacity for very abrupt change. We go to a change state, which may be much less good for us humans actually. Okay, so that's the theory. Um, if we go to the real world, we need to start thinking about the processes that move the ball down that slope that caused that tipping point. And the key concept here is a positive feedback loop. Now, you may have all, if anyone who's bred rabbits will be fully aware of what a positive feedback loop is. Today you have two rabbits, then you have four rabbits, then you have eight rabbits, 16 rabbits, and so on. They're breeding. And every single species on the planet has this capacity for exponential population growth. And actually humans, right now are doing that. It's exponential population growth. And that's a positive feedback. The more people we have, the more they can breed, and then the more, more people we get, and so on and so on. Now, in nature, we see these positive feedback loops in places like coral reefs. And coral reefs, you can think of as a sort of continuum between coral and seaweed. So we have areas with coral and areas with seaweed. But it's the fish that eat the seaweed that help the corals. And that's a, that's a positive feedback loop because the more the fish eat the seaweed, the more corals you get. And corals are where the fish breed. So the more corals we have, the more fish we have, the more seaweed they eat, the more corals we have. And it goes round and round in a feedback loop and keeps it as a coral reef. Now that can change, not only because of bleaching, but because of a whole range of other, other factors. So imagine we went to a coral reef and started to catch the fish. We harvested the fish. That can lead to more seaweed. Or we have nutrient runoff, or sedimentation, or disease outbreaks, or hurricanes. Or in fact, all of these factors may affect a reef. And all of them will drive it into a different feedback loop. So now we have no fish. So we have a lot of seaweed. The seaweed kills the corals, which reduces the number of fish. And we're trapped in a different state of the ecosystem. It's in one of those hollows on that diagram, and it's very difficult to get it out of there, to push it out. So that's why, uh, that's how you could get a big transition in an ecosystem, perhaps happen, happening quite quickly. But remember this issue of these multiple pressures, it's not just one arrow that's pushing the ball along the slope, it's many. Okay, so the rest of this talk is really around examples and stories that I discovered while I was reading this book. And I didn't know any of these really until I started researching it. So I learned a lot. And I wanted to share with you just some of the, uh, the stories that actually uh, impressed me the most and taught me the most. And I thought we'd start here in Dorset. Not everyone watching this is based in Dorset, but that's where our university is based. That's where I do a lot of my research. And uh, just down the road is this wonderful museum. It's called the Etchers Collection in Kimridge, a little village in Dorset. And uh, this is an amazing museum because it started off with Steve Etchers. It's his personal collection of fossils collected in the Jurassic Coast. And it started with a little fossil he found at the age of five. 
that has pride of place in this museum. So how wonderful this has developed into a, a lifetime's obsession and is is fantastic at finding and uh, preparing these fossils. Now, what's really special about this museum? Well, several things. One is that they've created this fantastic, it's like you're at a sea life center and you're seeing projections on the ceiling of the ocean, but it's the Jurassic ocean. So every now and again, some ammonites swim across or uh, a mosasaur or something goes by. It's just fantastic. We really like you there. But what's also amazing is the, um, how he's presented the fossils. So it's not just a load of old fossils, he's shown how they interacted as species. So it's about the ecology. So you can see an ammonite with a bite taken out of it and you can even work out what's eaten it. And you can find uh, things like turtles with fish in their stomachs and so on and so on. So you can really see who was eating who. And there was a lot of eating going on. So really very, very impressive museum. I encourage you to go there if you don't know it. But when I went there, uh, and this is, by the way, is what the fauna sort of may have looked like. Here we're seeing some big marine reptiles, uh, things like ple uh, plesiosaurs, pliosaurs, uh, ammonites, and lots of big sharks, and so on. So uh, as I was going to this museum, I've been a number of times now, I started to think, well, what happened to this amazing, wonderful Jurassic fauna? And I didn't know, so I looked it up. And the answer is this. It's a super volcano. Not only just any old volcano, but the biggest volcano in the solar system. And it's called the Shatsky Rise. Today, it's buried underneath the uh, Pacific Ocean. But I'd never heard of it. But here is uh, Olympus Mons, which is a big volcano on Mars for scale. So this is a massive volcano that erupted at the end of the Jurassic, caused a mass extinction. Now, of course, there's been many other mass extinctions. And the one that we're all now most familiar with is this one. It's the one that happened at the end of the Cretaceous, a bit later on. And uh, this was a bolide. We now know through fantastic research uh, that it was a bolide strike. In other words, an asteroid hitting planet Earth. And even more amazingly, we now know where the asteroid hit, which is in Yucatan in Mexico. And uh, this is actually an artist's impression of the measurements they've been taking. In fact, they've just drilled into this crater. And you can see under, under, this, under the surface of the rocks, these, these amazing uh, crater impressions. So the evidence of the crater is still there and it was a big one. In fact, it was the biggest asteroid strike anywhere in the solar system for the last half billion years. So it's really a significant event. And uh, what I really love about this, and this is, I put this in specially for any eminent paleontologists watching, there may be one or two lurking uh, in the community here. And I thought they might appreciate, if you go onto the net and search for uh, end Cretaceous asteroid strike, this is what you see. You see lots of wonderful evocative images like these, but they're also quite funny. I have to share this with you. So uh, if you look at this one, there's, I saw, there's a T-Rex watching the, uh, the asteroid plummeting down. And then here's another one. In fact, there's loads. The T-Rexes all seem to be looking up at this asteroid hurtling towards them as though it's some portent of doom. Um, but I looked this up and the, the asteroid itself, very interesting. It's about the size of Bournemouth and Poole, about seven miles across, about the size of Mount Everest. But it was traveling at a, an impressive 40,000 miles an hour. So it would have gone from deep space to impacting on the Earth in a split second. It would not have had time to, to watch it coming. And even more impressive than that, they actually would have all been wiped out by the shock wave way before the asteroid actually impacted. So this was a major and impressive event. Uh, I couldn't get over this wonderful one here. Oh, I think they're ankylosaurs hurtling through the air, uh, bursting into flames. Who knows? Maybe it was like that. I just, I love the imagination here. This is probably closer to reality. Here's another poor dinosaur uh, wailing uh, and complaining because here what's happened is there's an enormous dust cloud that's blotted out the sun and we know that happened and presumably had big impacts on the uh, vegetation. Now, the bit I like, I don't work on dinosaurs, I work on trees, far more important. Uh, and uh, what happened to the trees, the forest? This is devastating. So works on they were obliterated at a global scale. So, and it's the same evidence of a wall of fire moving away from this impact zone, just incinerating everything in its path. It's very hard to imagine that, but somebody's had a go at it here. And I'm lovely, you know, very nice, accurate conifer forest here, but going up in flames. Now, this raises the question then of what happened next. And this is where it gets interesting because 
yes, a lot of the world's species were obliterated, the world's forests were obliterated. We got a huge spike in fungi. So the spores of fungi in the fossil record, you can see the world was covered in fungi. And so that means that everything was dying and was being rotted down by this amazing burst of fungi living on all these dead things. And uh, then we also get what's called a fern spike. So you can see it here on this little diagram. So this is the number of fern spores. This is like bracken that might be familiar to you, sort of ferns that uh, are known to come in after fire very effectively. So we end up with basically fern dominated world. So the, the vegetation of the world was so destroyed, it was turned into a, a bracken planet. And the issue is here that you can see from this that it takes actually millions of years for the, uh, these forests to recover. Now, if we look at these extinctions, they can tell us a lot. And this is, uh, this is leading to what, uh, for me, was the biggest discovery of, uh, of writing this book. So if we have these, we, there's actually five really big mass extinctions, what's called the big five. There's the end Cretaceous one we were just uh, hearing about caused by this asteroid. And then before that, other ones at the end of the Triassic, Permian, Devonian and Ordovician. Now the Jurassic doesn't even make the top five. There was an extinction event there that wiped out the Kimmeridge fauna, but that doesn't make, it's not, it wasn't as, as impressive as these. And these are really impressive because we're wiping out something like 80 and 90% of the world's species. That's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of debate around now whether we're in another mass extinction event now. At the moment, it doesn't come close to these numbers, but it, perhaps it could in the future. Um, so, okay, so the causes of these, well, we have the bowline, but even in the end of the Cretaceous, it wasn't just the asteroid. We now know that this asteroid strike set off a massive volcanic eruption over in India in the Deccan Traps and uh, releasing a huge amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, changing the chemistry of the oceans and leading to massive climate change. And you can see here that climate change is a feature of four of the last five mass extinction events. So this is not something to be taken lightly. Greater Thunberg is right. And, and what's also interesting, and this is the bit that really blew my mind, um, is that three of them were, were uh, involving volcanoes, massive volcanic activity, which put a huge amount of this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. What happened to that? Well, because the ocean chemistry changed as a result of this, that and um, oxygen was depleted. The oceans died on an epic scale. And that meant that dead things didn't rot down. So they accumulated in sediment. And that's the basis of our fossil fuels that we use today. And as I say, this is what blew my mind because it's the very same carbon that created these previous mass extinction events that we're now releasing back into the atmosphere when we burn or use fossil fuels. It's the same carbon. It's as if the Earth thought, how am I going to deal with all this extra CO2? I know, well, let's just obliterate all the world's species and bury them in sediment and leave them there to trap and store the carbon. It's kind of like how, how it happened. And now we're releasing that very same carbon back so we can see what the implications will be if we don't stop this. Uh, would be these exactly same phenomena. It's the same carbon. So that's what blew my mind. I just didn't know that. OK, so I'm going to move the clock forward now, millions of years, uh, to much closer to human history. And this is another story that I was very struck by, which is what happened to the Australian megafauna. Now, if you, were, if you wind the clock back about, uh, people arrived into Australia around about 50 or 60,000 years ago. And by the way, that's another epic story, because they had to get there by boat. So they must have been making ocean-going craft sailing something longer than the journey across the English Channel over ocean, to the Pacific Ocean, to arrive in Australia. What an astounding achievement by uh, the ancestors of the, of the modern Aborigines. It's incredible what they did. But when they got there, when they arrived, they discovered this amazing megafauna. Now, it's hard to see the scale here, but there's a giant goose that's more than two meters tall. And there was a giant wombat, which was the size of a VW beetle. That's some wombat, isn't it? And then massive monitor lizards uh, several meters long, and so on and so on. A very rich megafauna of big animals. And there were more. There was this thing like uh, uh, the protodon. It's like a big sort of uh, uh, 
hippo or something like that, but it's marsupial. And it's about the same size as, as a hippo. And then this amazing thing, it looks like a big cat. Uh, it's called the, the drop cat, but it wasn't a cat, it's another marsupial. They think that it lurked in trees and dropped on its prey to catch it that way. And uh, you just imagine being your, you know, you just got off the boat after an epic journey across the ocean as, as one of the first settlers of Australia, and then you're confronted by something like that, deeply scary. And then there's giant marsupials as well. Now, all of these animals disappeared rather soon after human arrival. So there's a big debate around whether was this climate change or was it people? There's no doubt that people had an impact. And uh, one of the ways they had an impact was through burning. So there's a traditional approach to land use in Australia. The Aborigines use it's called fire stick farming. They basically set fire to stuff. And at the bottom here, you can see a lovely painting. This is from the 18th century, so quite early on of, and it's a fabulous account of how they did it. So you can see them here with their spears. And if you look closely with their boomerangs, remember they're lethal weapons and uh, using fire to flush out the game, which they would then uh, attack with spears, clubs and uh, their boomerangs. Now, what we need to think of is that the scale of that, the people move through the whole continent within just a few centuries. And although the population numbers were often low, they were there a very, very long time. You know, 50 odd thousand years is an immense amount of time. So the accumulated effect of this burning and this hunting was to change the uh, Australian ecosystems profoundly. All these big animals went extinct. Everything bigger than a person was driven to extinction. And um, you had this, for me as an ecologist interested in collapse, this very instinct phenomenon took place. So Australia was once covered with large amounts of rainforest. There's now only a little of that left but um, it used to be much more extensive. Now, what happens if you stop burning things is you have another of these feedback loops that I mentioned earlier. And this feedback, what that means is as you burn, those species of plant that can actually tolerate fire start to dominate. And in, in Australia, of course, that's eucalyptus forest. And we tend to think of eucalypts as iconic um, Australian plants, trees, but they were quite rare relatively uh, prior to the arrival of people. So it's people that really driven the expansion of uh, eucalypt forest. And because it's adapted to fire, it also promotes fire. So the more fire you have, the more eucalypts you have. It's another one of these feedback loops. Okay, so if we, if we think of then other megafauna extinctions and uh, if at the end of the last ice age, throughout the world there's been a large number of big animals, not so much the small animals, it's the big animals that have gone extinct and uh, huge numbers. So in North America, about 34, and uh, South America, about 50. I mean, this is a giant armadillo. It's really not to scale. <laughs> it looks like it's bigger than a mammoth. It wasn't quite that big. But anyway, a large number of big animals in South America also went extinct. We've talked about Australia uh, and Europe as well. And this diagram is trying to illustrate what we currently believe about the relative influence of humans in red and climate change in blue. It's actually very hard to separate those two factors. They may both have played a role, but um, either way, we lost a lot of big animals. Again, whatever the cause, the impact that I'm interested in is on the ecosystems themselves. Uh, oh yeah, this is just a picture of these wonderful cave paintings at Chauvet that were in France that were recently discovered. These are just magical. They're some of the best artworks ever done in some artist, artist uh, view. And uh, they're absolutely gorgeous. So as you can see a load of Ice Age horses and big cats. And it looks like the animals are running, doesn't it? And uh, things like their, their woolly rhino and, and so on. Amazing. We now know this cave is more than 30,000 years old. Uh, it's at least 29,000 years old, which is amazing because these are some of the best cave art that was ever done. So the people just didn't believe that they could be so old, but they are. And, uh, and yet virtually all of these animals have gone extinct. So it's an amazing little insight into a vanished fauna. What was that like to live with? Well, here's an artist's impression. And uh, yes, of course, it's a bit fanciful. They've packed the whole landscape here with big animals, but you would have had a huge diversity. Again, a whole range of big cats, saber-toothed cats, uh, many different bear species, massive dire wolves, um, sort of bison and these lovely ponies and many species of mammoth. 
So this was called the mammoth step. And uh, it's hard to comprehend now, but it's stretched. If you see this little graphic at the top, all the way from Europe, all the way through uh, um, uh, the Asian continent, right through to North America, including Beringia, which was the link between the Asia and America at the time was, was dry land. Now, what's interesting is this is an ecosystem that's not only the big animals gone, but so is the vegetation. And that's really interesting because there's a lot of thought now that it was the animals that kept this grassland, it was a grassland, but it was very herb rich, very rich in species. It could have been the animals that kept this maintained through another feedback loop. The more they grazed it, the more those species that could tolerate grazing would dominate. And it was, as I say, very species rich. So the mammoth steppe is gone. Was that because these animals were hunted to extinction? Well, I'm going to roll the clock forward again now with about 7,000 years ago. I hope you're keeping up as with a Doctor Who style zooming through time. Uh, and now we're, we're focusing on the Sahara. And you may know that uh, around 7,000 years ago, something like that, the Sahara was not a desert. It was green. It was a big grassland and wetland. It had many rivers and lakes. There's good fossil evidence of people eating fish in what is now the middle of the Sahara. There's lovely rock paintings of things like giraffes and also very significantly lovely rock art of large numbers of domesticated animals, livestock. And that's what happened. So we look at this bottom uh, map here. We now, of course, know that uh, domestication, of, you know, agriculture begins, I don't know, around 8,000 years ago in the Near East, and then it spreads into North Africa. So these are big pastoral communities with big herds of recently, di recently domesticated livestock. And they must have been a bit wilder than they are now, so maybe are more difficult to control. That's worth thinking about, isn't it? But then they move through North Africa. So by 7,000 years, they got this far, 6,000 years ago, this far, and so on. So they, they, they moved through this amazing rich grassland. And of course, as they went, the animals would be eating the grass and uh, maybe started to degrade it. And that seems to have kicked off another feedback loop with the local climate, very much influenced by the ocean. If there's less plants, they're evaporating less moisture. So you lose the rainfall. That seems to be maybe what happened. So it could be then that what we think of as the desert, today Sahara Desert, could be an epic example of ecosystem collapse driven by human activity, which I just didn't know when I, when I started writing this book. Now there's, there's other epic stories of human history that I didn't know. And here's another one, Madagascar. And uh, here's another epic voyage. This is truly epic. There's some amazing DNA work been done and linguistic analysis on the modern uh, people living in Madagascar. They speak, the, the indigenous language is very, very closely related to another lang uh, language from Indonesia. And the DNA supports the same story, which seems to be, and this is hard to believe, but a boatload of mostly women, about 40 people, they think, that was blown off course, this little fishing boat, <laughs> that was blown off course. We're talking 3,000 years ago. This is mind blowing, isn't it? Uh, it was blown off course all the way across the Indian Ocean. And they were some of the first colonists. And uh, it's truly extraordinary what these people made of their, I, I imagine they were very relieved to find land at all after many days. And if you think, well, this is just impossible. How could this happen? It actually happened again around uh, well, the time of World War II, another Japanese fisherman did the same journey. So it is possible. But what they encountered was another megafauna. So we had things like the elephant bird and giant fossas and uh, many other species of lemur. They're all gone, all extinct. And uh, again, the ecosystems were transformed by the use of fire in particular, killing it, hunting the animals and burning stuff, burning the vegetation. And uh, you can see the decline in uh, uh, forest cover, particularly the rainforest in the mountains, but also the dry forest along the coast. And another epic journey, and this is equally mind blowing. Uh, if you think of the Polynesian uh, expansion throughout the South Pacific, again, involving truly epic journeys on these amazing boats that uh, the Polynesian culture still treasures today using extraordinary feats of um, navigation. But I'm gonna focus here on New Zealand 
So they're arriving in New Zealand. Look at this, look how far they went. Not even knowing, I guess, whether there was an island at the end of their journey. So uh, truly amazing. And obviously a one-way journey. Uh, so, they, so people arrived there about 1200 AD, roughly. And I'm going to use the example of Middle Earth here, because of course, New Zealand featured in Peter Jackson's recent films, Lord of the Rings. And a lot of people went over there and uh, took holidays in New Zealand, inspired by this wonderful, pristine landscape of New Zealand, which of course is a complete myth because we go, this is where the hobbits live in the Shires, Hobbiton. There's not a native New Zealand species in that whole scene. And there's, I've discovered a wonderful website called The Botany, Middle Earth, which basically goes through the whole of these films and works out which species you can see. And it's a, it's a devastating story. If you know the films, here's, here's Frodo and Sam with Gandalf setting off, leaving the Shire, but they're walking through a pine plantation, which is another non-native species. And what I was particularly shocked by was all of this lovely ground cover here. It's an invasive, weedy species, not native to New Zealand at all. And then we see the same again down here. Here's uh, Frodo zooming across this lovely landscape, being pursued by the Black Riders. Very exciting bit of the film. Uh, but what are they? What are they riding across? It's a tussock grassland. So a tussock grass is a native New Zealand species, but that's a degraded ecosystem. That was an ecosystem that was burnt by the first colonists. It used to be shrubland, so it's collapsed into this degraded regularly burnt uh, tussock grassland. And now what's really interesting, it's being invaded by these trees. These aren't native to New Zealand either. It's Pinus radiator that's gone invasive there. So, and that's turning these grasslands into pine uh, forestry. So Mexican species, it doesn't belong there at all. So you've almost got a collapsed species, a collapsed ecosystem that's now collapsing again. It's, it's transforming again. The ball is moving around that landscape into something else. So this diagram summarizes these recent examples I've been giving you of Madagascar, New Zealand, Australia. The role of fire comes up over and over again. It's really important. Why is that? Well, it's because of these feedbacks that I mentioned. So you can think of, again, the ball, uh, like I showed you earlier in the landscape, there could be two states. One is what's called pyrophobic. So this is vegetation that doesn't like being burnt. It's never been burnt before. People arrive there with fire, start to burn it. It starts to move the vegetation into another state of species that do like fire. And as I say, these species are often fire promoting. And then you're stuck in a feedback loop, which is very hard to get out of. So this helps us understand why the collapse of ecosystems in Madagascar New Zealand, many, many other uh, uh, places, but throughout the South Pacific, many of the islands suffer the same fate. And it's because of this, this fire feedback. Now to bring us up to the current uh, era, of course, as I was writing this book, every day seemed to bring another environmental catastrophe. The, main, the massive bushfires in Australia, which is what I put on the book cover, killed more than a billion animals, it's estimated. These were unprecedented fires. And since then, we've had fires uh, in California, uh, in the Amazon, and in Indonesia, totally unprecedented in terms of their scale and intensity. And there's a lot of concern now about what's happening in the Amazon. And uh, if there's a lot of deforestation going on, but also climate change. And there's evidence that uh, the, the rainforest is drying out and perhaps becoming a savanna. And it's predicted that. Um, by the end of this century, there could be hardly any rainforest left. This is another epic disaster. This is the most biodiverse place on Earth, where it has almost all of the world's fish species, for example, and um, freshwater fish. It really is a terrible thing to imagine it disappearing. But I wanted to bring it home. You, we tend to think of these things, well, oh, this stuff happened a long way away or a long time ago. Ecosystem collapse is not relevant to here. Here I'm living in Dorset. We tend to think of Dorset as a lovely benign place, which it is. It's the most biodiverse place in England and Britain. But nonetheless, we've been doing some research here that shows that this too has undergone a massive transformation in the last 80 years from lovely, rich, calcareous grassland and unimproved grassland 
to arable farming and improved grassland. And most of these species have been eliminated from most of the county. It's a very dramatic, abrupt change. And we've done a little report on that, that if you want a copy, I can send you. And the other place on that doorstep I've been working is the New Forest. And uh, most people go to New Forest. And I I'd actually took the local manager there to this place. You can see at the bottom. I said, well, what do you think of this? He said, this is lovely. It's perfect for a picnic. It's just what we want. It's open, it's grassy. Uh, it's got lovely oak trees in it. That's just what we want. I said, 50 years ago, this was a beech forest. It's completely different. And the beech forest has died and it's still dying. And this is tragic because these beech forests are the oldest in Britain. They go back 8,000 when beech emerged out of its ice age refugia and moved north. And uh, New Forest was one of the first places it arrived. And it's been there ever since. And now it's dying. And this is really sad because there are hundreds of species in the New Forest that depend on beech. And uh, you can see it dying. And it, we've been monitoring this. And it's turning into a grassland. It's a, it's a great example of collapse. It's a very bad uh, example of what's happening because of climate change. We are absolutely sure that that's the driver. All right, so I'm going to summarize here. Uh, I'm now fast forwarding to the end of the book, sparing you all the detail and trying to find, pick out a few take home messages. The first is, are well, the world's ecosystems about to collapse? Uh, some people say the whole biosphere is at risk of collapse. It's possible, but it's unlikely right now. What's much more likely is local scale collapse. And the surveys that have been done are showing every ecosystem we look at is, be, is collapsing at the local scale, like the beech forest in the, in the new forest, at, at the local small scale, lots of collapse going on. So the issue is, will that add up into a more large scale disaster? It could happen. Some ecosystems are more at risk than others. We don't really know why yet, so that's another area for research. As I've been saying, according to theory, feedbacks can increase the risk of collapse, and there's good evidence for this. But what I showed by going through all these examples in the book is there's lots and lots in there. I find actually there's many other causes of collapse, not just uh, these feedbacks. Um, the main issue is these, the situation we discussed briefly right at the start, when you have multiple pressures affecting existence together. And uh, the other thing I really learned from writing this book is greater is really, really right. Climate change could be a greater threat than anything else. Maybe it isn't right now, but this is the way we're heading. Remember, we're releasing all that, uh, all those liquefied dinosaurs. Um, it also interacts with all the other pressures. So fire, land use, invasive species, they're all worse under climate change. But I'm going to finish with just a quick moment of positivity, because I know you don't want doom and gloom. Uh, I said the book's also about recovery. Yes, a collapsed ecosystem could say, stay collapse, but it can also recover. And ecosystems often have really powerful uh, ability uh, to recover. And I just want to close with this little positive message from Dorset. Here we have the first Dorset beavers that were released here in about the last 400 years. They're now back in Dorset, which is very exciting. And also from my home, I can just about see the Isle of Wight, where they've just re-released uh, these seagulls, magnificent birds. They've been spotted here in Dorset, but they've flown all the way up to Scotland and all the way over to Germany. But the home is the other way. So very exciting. Great. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your talk, Adrian. Yep, yeah, we're, we're just going to take a break. Um, if we make it five minutes and then we can come back. There's already some discussion in the chat, so we can continue with that when we come back. No so see we'll you see soon. you in five minutes. Yeah. Okay, so welcome back everyone. Um, so we'll start off by looking at some of the questions that are in the, the chat. So are you ready, Adrian? <laughs> okay, so to start off with, this is a question from Sam Greenhill. Would you suggest that it's likely if we don't stop burning fossil fuels and continue until all the world's oil reserves are dried up? then we're very likely to be putting the planet's climate into a similar state to what was experienced at the end of the Jurassic. That's a great question. Uh, I'd have to go away, and do this, go away and do the sums to work out exactly um, whether that's true or not. 
definitely it's a really bad idea to burn all the fossil fuel, whether it would quite match. I mean, if you look back at, at the history of uh, carbon dioxide concentrations in the, in the Earth's atmosphere, sometimes it was much, much higher than it is now, almost unbelievably higher. And it's these big volcanic events that did that. So um, it all depends on how much petroleum there is left. And that's actually a remarkably difficult thing to know because all the countries that have it don't let us know how much they've got. Uh, so they're kind of keeping that quiet. So we really don't know how much oil is left. And uh, there may be a lot less than we think. This is my wife, Lynn, is living the tea. There might be a lot less than we think, or, or there could be more. And if you start to factor in things like oil shale. So it's a great question. I can't give a precise answer. All I can say is that it would be equivalent to a, a very big volcanic event, yes. And this is a similar one of, let's find out your prediction. Um, how long will it be before the Brazilian rainforest reaches a tipping point? That's a really another great question, and one that uh, I actually sent my students to to think about. I'm very concerned about it. I was less concerned about the Amazon because it's an immense, immense area. Uh, uh, I was lucky enough to see it just once flying over it. And um, I was just amazed by the, the sheer scale of it. Uh, but it's hard to convey in these maps just what's going on in the ground. And um, what we have now that we didn't have a few years back is really good data. There's been people going out and putting little survey plots all the way through the Amazon, including areas that were, you know, 20 years ago were very inaccessible. So we now know that the forest is changing much more rapidly than we thought. And there are some of these very dangerous feedbacks. For example, we know that the rainfall that falls near the Andes is derived from forest further to the east. So in other words, if you cut the forest down near the coast, then it's gonna dry up the interior because the rainfall sort of cycles it falls on the forest, it's re-evaporated and so on. So there could be some very dangerous feedbacks. Um, there are estimates that within the next 20, 30 years, we may hit that tipping point, maybe even earlier. It all depends on how resilient these trees are to drought. And uh, again, there the news is not good. So yeah, I'm, very, I'm, I'm now much more concerned than I was. So moving on to invasive species. <laughs> Um, so we've, we've got a, a question from Richard Williams, which is around rewilding. Um, and it's rewilding is a popular concept at the moment, but does the presence of invasive, invasive species, as well as the changing climate, mean that it may not be possible to restore ecosystems to what they were just by leaving things alone? What's the best route towards restored ecosystems? Yeah, well, that's another great question that's really engaging a lot of minds at the moment, because, um, again, if you wind the clock, I was involved in a big rewilding project about 20 years ago, where we tried to recreate uh, a woodland, a forest in Scotland, actually, Sharon, you might appreciate this, and um, it's in uh, it's near Moffat, and it's been a big success, so what was bare hit, hillside is now a massive native woodland with uh, with full of species. So I'm a big believer in rewilding. I think it's a really positive thing that we can do. But in that project, we had huge debates around, well, what are we, are we recreating what was here 6,000 years ago when there was last forest on this site? That's a long time. And the climate was different then. And we can't escape the fact that climate change is happening and it's gonna affect all rewilding and restoration projects wherever they take place. So whatever we do is, is sort of under this continual change in the climate. And there's, there is no new normal. It's going to carry on changing uh, just as we think things might settle down. It's, it's not. If we carry on emitting CO2, we'll just carry on changing. So it's going to be very difficult for any existence sort of uh, reach an equilibrium. I, I think it's about it's around permanent change. So a lot of people who work on restoration say it's now almost pointless to think back and to try and recreate something. Let's just instead just support nature. Let's just let wild processes take care of themselves. We're going to end up with a very different, maybe novel ecosystems. Um, I always think of the cliffs in Bournemouth as a great example of that. There's hardly a native species on there, but it sort of functions. And uh, so that's what we're going to be having is lots of invasive species. You're quite right coming in. It's going to be impossible to stop them. And when does an invasive species 
that become a problem or not? That's another really fascinating issue. A lot of species arriving every day from the continent. Some of them are new. We see them in our garden. Lots of insects are coming in. They're tracking the, the warming climate. Are they invasive or not? There's nothing we can do to stop them coming. We just have, I think, to, to accept that the ecosystems we're going to have in the future are going to be very different than the ones uh, we have in the past. I mean, if you see projections for the new forest, some people think that within about 30 years, it's basically going to be Mediterranean there in terms of its climate. So we're talking radical changes on the way. Which do have their benefits, such as the English sparkling wine industry. <laughs> 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 um, so the, another couple of questions were just round about that idea of, um, and pretty much that you've answered round about invasive species and um, whether or not we should be going for a restored ecosystem or should we try to allow a more dynamic ecosystem to be restored? Yeah, I think I sort one of have answered that. I mean, one, one of the things I really love that I mentioned are these uh, reintroduction projects. Things like the beavers and the seagulls, because it gets people excited. And I'm a big fan of what they've done at Nep Estate in Sussex. When I first went there about 20 years ago, uh, this is a guy who's a private landowner. He had a big sort of manor house. And uh, when I first went there, uh, I thought, what's he doing? He's, he's, had a, he's digging a pipeline on his lawn. This is a beautiful National Trust type lawn in front of his big house. And uh, it looked like he'd had a mini digger and gone up and down it and up and down it. But what he'd done was just put his Tamworth pigs out there. So he's let, he's let his, his, his livestock just go wild. And uh, at the time I thought, and actually he was having doubts because his lawn had just been devastated by it. His pigs had just excavated it. Uh, but it's been a spectacular success. So now it's the best place in the whole country to go and see purple emperor butterflies. They've just had the first breeding storks there. Uh, so you can go see storks again for the first, first time in, in, in a couple hundred years in Britain. That's, that's what gets people excited. And, uh, and because he's letting things go wild, I think it makes the system more resilient. So, you know, he's letting species regenerate naturally. And I think that's the best aspect of rewilding that we really need to, to implement more wide, widely. Yeah, I've got friends that live um, near a farm in Scotland where they, they've sort of been nurturing red kites that they've they've managed to reintroduce to the area. They've got red squirrels back in the, the woodlands and um, they're, they're looking at bringing in some beavers there as well. But a lot of what they're doing is just planting stuff that's going to allow sort of more species to come in. So it's a working farm, but it's also got all these sort of um, pathways and sort of corridors for, for the other species. Well, I, I really do think rewilding is such a, a positive idea. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of debate around what it might look like, what, what will happen, but uh, just the process of getting people excited uh, about nature and doing something positive, I think is a really powerful thing we, that we need to do. So um, next question. Um... Sorry, I'm, I'm just sort of... <laughs> trying to, to figure out which ones are, are building on, lots of things building on each other. Um, so although ecosystems do recover, presumably, presumably the time taken depends on the scale of the collapse. And there's a huge difference between local, a few years and global collapses. Where would you rate the current ecosystem threat, threat on that scale? And do you think humans can mitigate the threat as it happens? Well, that's, that's a whole a whole load of great questions. All a lot to unpack there. It's one of the things. Yeah. On that. Um, <laughs> Took me a lot just to read it. <laughs> yeah, it did, didn't it? Uh, yeah, you, you're quite right. I mean, one of the things what I did there was skip from global mass extinction events to more local, net, national scale or regional uh, ecosystem collapses. Yeah. So the these mass extinction events were global, absolutely. So it's on an entirely different scale. And what's happening to an individual uh, country or ecosystem. But what, what I'm interested in there is the, um, the fact that global change happened, but it also created lots of much more local scale effects. And so what you see at the global scale is built up from a picture of lots of smaller scale things. And that, that relationship of smaller scale to global scale is a big, big issue right now and one that we're, we're actually trying to research 
I know I've just been discussing that this week, because it's a big question we don't really know. We don't know, for example, if you have lots of uh, collapses happening in a, in a country, if, 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 if could a larger scale problem start to happen, could a, bro a broader scale tipping point, like in the Amazon, for example, if you have deforestation here, here, here and here, could it actually add together to create a bigger risk for a regional tipping point? The answer is yes, at least in some cases, that's definitely the case, particularly where there's feedbacks with climate. And remember, in the Amazon, there really is. So I think that's that's my answer to that question, um, where we are on that continuum. There's good evidence now that every single ecosystem on Earth is being affected by people in one way or another, usually by multiple pressures. And that's my biggest concern, having written this book, is you see that everywhere. So you see logging and burning and herbivory and invasive species. It's, it's stacking up these threats and then putting climate change on top that really puts our existence at risk. And that's happening in many, many places. Um, so, uh, but, but the recovery is always possible. I mean, what, we learnt, what I learned through the project in Scotland, the forest had been gone there for 6,000 years and yet it's back. So that's why I put that at the last page of my book as a, as a message of hope. It's never too late to start, and it's possible to restore even very degraded ecosystems. I hope that answered that, that set of questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to follow on from that, we'd like to welcome Kim, who's joining us from Bay Area in California, who has made a comment around about the, the reference to the Aral Sea that you spoke about rem reminded them of Tulare Lake, which used to exist in Southern California and used to be the largest lake in California, but is no longer. Well, yeah, that's an, another great example. And, uh, you know, we were lucky, my family and I were lucky enough to visit California a few years ago. We were, we were just blown away by the, not only the wonderful wildlife, the people were fantastic too. So it's really tragic to see the large scale fires that have been happening there, even in the, the redwood forest that we might see, you know, a lot of that's been damaged. These are really unprecedented events that are really shifting the, the Californian ecosystems, which are so species rich. And uh, um, we, we were lucky enough to meet some Native Americans when we were there that say, well, we need to, we need to go, go back to how we used to manage this, so the, the sort of low intensity fires to reduce the amount of but big issues around water there too, absolutely. And I think I'm just sort of trying to look. So um, the, there was a comment about um, George Peterkin's talks about future natural forest types and what might we expect here in the UK? Yeah, well, George so, did some great thinking it around on where uh, you are exactly as well, these isn't knotty it? <laughs> issues around um, what does natural even mean? <laughs> and uh, he, 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 for those who don't know, he came up with this lovely phrase of, of uh, a future natural. So that could be a sort of, uh, if I remember correctly, a vision of the future where it's not like now, but climate change is going to take us on a new trajectory. But nonetheless, it can still be natural in the sense that natural processes can still operate. So, for example, instead of planting trees, we let them reproduce naturally. If you do that, like they're doing at NEP, then the whole system becomes more resilient. So future natural is certainly better than future artificial. We should be trying to let nature take its course. And that's the whole basis of a rewilding as an idea. And, and you've got a bit of a challenge from um, one of our regulars, Liz Sheridan, who's asking about what you think about planting trees to roll back the Zara. Might be a bit of a job. <laughs> well, the, the project I really liked was at one point they were trying to plant plastic trees, and uh, um, that was I think when Gaddafi was in in charge, he had this big vision of. Uh, and actually, it's not daft because if you get trees uh, in the right places, they can actually capture moisture, even if they're plastic ones. Um, but uh, yeah, there's there's actually massive efforts to. Uh, stop the spread of the Sahara through reforestation and some great um, grassroots uh, activities around that and uh, which have had some real successes. I think that if you really want to see epic success in terms of restoration, you have to go to China, which also has deserts, remember, and they've done spectacular jobs in greening their deserts. Uh, that's, and uh, so it can be done if the political will is there and you have a government, I have to say this, there's, you know, there's the 
there's lots of negative things you could say about the Chinese government, but when they make up their mind for a, a technical solution, we need to solve this problem of, of land degradation, they've really gone for it. And they now have more forest plantations than anywhere, any other country on earth, which is an amazing achievement. Uh, now, again, the ecological value of those may be uh, negative as well as positive, but in terms of stopping defor um, desertification, they've had a big, big impact. So yeah, I mean, I think tree planting in the right places is, is absolutely appropriate. And the last one that I've got here is, do you have any hope that the COP on biodiversity can drive a global response to combat ecological collapse? Yeah, well, that's a great, another great question. <laughs> and um, so for those who don't know, the COP is the biodiversity convention that's uh, supposed to be meeting this year. And um, I used to work for the UN, so I'm a bit biased here because, uh, and I joined the UN to work with them because I really believe that if we've got a global problem, the only way of solving it is for all of the countries of the world uh, to come together and thrash out how we're gonna do that. And that's what the UN is for. And that's what the uh, Biodiversity Convention seeks to do. And I actually got to attend some of their meetings, which were just amazing. You know, all the countries in there in alphabetical order, and, uh, you know, and Andorra and Albania all the way down to Zambia and so on. They're all there. And a lot of the people they send as delegates to these meetings are incredibly dedicated and are really working hard to do this. And uh, so I think I do have hope, having seen how seriously a lot of countries are taking these issues. Uh, yes, we tend to see the news around Europe and the US, but the world is much more than that. And, uh, it, you know, for example, things like the Climate Change Convention is, is the same. Sometimes we are led by what you might call these smaller countries or, or developing countries who show us the way. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I do have hope. I think it's the our main hope, actually. And uh, we, we need to not be cynical about these efforts because um, we really need to make make them work and support them. So, yeah, I think it's the, a really important mechanism to to uh, to help. In terms of collapse, though, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why I've written this book is to help put collapse on the map. Uh, and I don't think the COP, uh, the CBD, the convention, is really taking it seriously enough yet. And having written this book, I'm now even more convinced that I need to wave the flag a bit in the right circles there, uh, consult my old colleagues in the UN. <laughs> Uh, to get to take, take this on board. And that's why I think this IUCN red list of big system uh, is, is such an important step because, because it's now producing evidence of what's happening to our world. Remember, it's this really important point, this, that it's very easy to forget. There is no global monitoring of our ecosystem condition. We don't know what condition all of our ecosystems are in. That's not being done. Nobody's doing that. So uh, there's a thing that could really be done and actually tell us give us early warning of when this collapse is likely to happen. I think that would be a very positive thing. Uh, and that's what I'm going to recommend to the UN if I get a chance to uh, speak to them. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a very good point that, that was made earlier that, that was a, a comment and um, that I think is, is a good place to start is that people need to write to their MPs and tell them how um, enthusiastic and how passionate they are about us doing something about it. Well, that was a great place to start. I mean, I have, I have problems with my own particular MP here, and I'm writing to him all the time. In fact, I've met him you know, in the town here, and uh, some of these guys are, are tough nuts to crack. But if you don't write to them, then they don't need to think it's important. So it definitely plays a role, and I do it regularly, and I encourage other people to do it. But there's other ways of effecting change as well. And Greater Thunberg is just such an inspiration, I think, because uh, without writing to any MPs, she's changed the whole narrative around this. What an amazing achievement. And it sparked similar movements, uh, you know, school, school kids getting organized all around the world. It just shows what an individual can actually do. And uh, I found her, you know, her example very, very inspiring. I think that's it, isn't it? That she's managed to actually get people's imaginations and particularly kids and getting them actually enthusiastic about it. Yeah, well, I think I really feel course. strongly around, uh, around the next generation because I spent time teaching students and uh, I have a son who's, who's the same age as, as the students I'm teaching. And uh, I think it's very easy to get into a sort of negative narrative, isn't it? Because we c it's very easy to see there's lots of these problems happening. What about the people that's 
you know, sort of going to inherit this planet soon uh, from us oldies. And uh, um, they really need to have hope because otherwise it's going to be kind of self reinforcing, isn't it? If, if people believe, I've been reading a lot about dystopian fiction, about the fact we're all watching zombie movies and uh, dystopian, reading dystopian novels. And that sort of creates a mindset that the world is kind of going wrong. And, and if we all believe that, we're sort of uh, acclimated to that idea, then that's what's going to happen because uh, it's going to be self-fulfilling. So I, th I, think it, I think it's really important we give a narrative to our younger uh, uh, people that's much more positive and around things they can do. And that's again why Greater uh, Thunberg has been so important. Showing, uh, actually, she's a bit negative on hope, isn't she? Uh, <laughs> she? She says, well, you don't need hope to act. You've got to act first, even if you haven't got any hope. But I, I, I do have hope. And, uh, uh, and I think the hope comes in the, the creativity people have, and it's lots of grassroots initiative like the rewilding project and putting beavers back. These people are doing these things because they believe in them. Uh, they're really positive steps that actually gives people hope. And I think those, those are really, really important. And a really important question to ask you, where can we get your book? <laughs> oh, that's very important, yes, uh, in all good bookshops. It's, as I say, it's Cambridge University Press. If you go on their website, you should be able to order it. Uh, but I think I think Amazon, no, you're not, no, not allowed to buy anything from Amazon now. Go, go to Cambridge University Press website. <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's quite technical, but it does tell these stories and there are a few jokes in it. So it's not all dry academic stuff, although there is some. <laughs> so I think if nobody else has got any questions, um, then all I've left is to say thank you very much, Adrian. For a fascinating yeah, talk. I think you've left everybody with lots to think about um, and about how things are going to be. And again, thank you everybody for coming out, uh, well, for coming out, for sitting in your living room and, yeah. and listening to our talk. It's a bit surreal. I, I, was, but... I was almost back in Cafe Boscanova there. I was almost there. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for, for listening to the talk and we hope we'll see you again sometime soon. And thank you for all the kind comments in the chat, which I really, really appreciate that. That's very kind of you. And if anybody is interested, then the video will be available um, just as soon as it can be processed and put up on our YouTube channel. So once again, thanks very much for joining us and hope to see you all again soon. Bye. <laughs>